I think there are four words, in a sense, symbolize our struggles. Democratize, decolonize, decommodify, depatriarchalize. There are four words that, in a sense, mean everything that we are up to at this point. We are at universities, uh, you know, be they old or new, but the institution is such is one of the oldest institutions in modernity, in Western modernity. In fact, contrary to what uh, Europeans think, the most uh, ancient universities are not Europeans, European universities. In fact, the best university for many, many centuries, from the 9th century onwards, is Al-Azhar in Cairo, in Egypt. And before it, uh, Timbuktu in Mali, which is now Mali. But usually these universities are out of the canon. We think that uh, the university started with Bologna, uh, and in fact one of my university, the Coimbra University in Portugal, is one of the oldest, uh, 1290. Uh, but you think that this is a kind of an European innovation, which is not. And, and therefore I think that we are at a time in which I think it's very important for us to learn from the experiences of other countries in terms of institutions, of universities, because there have been so many movements outside Europe which we don't know, and, and, uh, and um, we should know more. And why should we know more? Uh, because of the problems that the students were raising. I mean, this uh, is, is a really a, a serious problem that we are now facing in Europe and everywhere. And, uh, you know, I, you can imagine coming from Southern Europe, we see that very well in Portugal, in Greece, in Spain. Um, but uh, we can see also in, in, here in Denmark. In fact, there's a general process that we are involved in which aims at destroying the university as we know it. When we discuss today the university of the future, basically the question is whether the university has a future as we know it. Because in 10 years' time or 20 years' time, maybe an enterprise like any other. What is at stake? What is it say? Well, why is this happening, basically? It's happening for several reasons. Uh, the first reason is that, as you know, the universities were created in, throughout Europe, just uh, you know, to go to the modern period, basically to train elites. Of course, the working class were not supposed to come to the university. Uh, the popular universities were created, quite frankly, uh, what each thing, also again in Egypt, the first university, popular university, was created in 1898 in Alexandria by Italian workers. Because as you know, since the workers were out of universities, they had to find ways of uh, having knowledge of Buddha. So they found the universities, popular universities. And in fact, there were socialist groups uh, of the time, which Marx later on called the, the or earlier had called the utopian socialists. They thought that through education they could change the working class. They were the anarchists, of course, and later, later on the communists. And, and in fact, there is a, a wealth of popular universities throughout Europe, um, based on the idea that since the, the popular classes are, are uh, marginalized and excluded from the universities, they, they have to find other ways of learning and, and acquiring knowledge. Well, and the elites, why the elites? Well, the elites basically because there was a, the idea that we need in any country a project of a country. A project, the idea of Denmark, the idea of, of Germany, the idea of France, the idea of Portugal. The idea that and this, in fact, this model went to other uh, continents when they became independent in, in Latin America in the, in the 19th century and in Africa. Uh, in, uh, in the middle of the, uh, this, uh, the past century. So the idea is that uh, the universities are places, a very specific place, because it's a public institution, but it's not run as a bureaucracy. It has autonomy. Because the idea is the uh, elites have to produce critical independent knowledge to run their countries. So this idea of a country project is very important. So you cannot understand the university, the Nehru University in Delhi, without this idea of an India. What is India? So they were, in a sense, in a sense think tanks for the elites. And the states financed them because the state, of course, was dominated by the elites. Why has this changed? 
Because now, for neoliberalism, for global financial capitalism in which we are in now, the idea of a country is anathema, is, is a bad idea, because we are in a global world. And the elites deserted their own universities. The elites of this country are training their children at the global universities, which are a few of them. Harvard, Oxford, Yale, London School of Economics. The elites are not using their universities in their own countries anymore. And that's why the state is not investing in the universities anymore. The elites are going outside. Look at the elites of the people here that come from the very least board schools. They go to them. They, they don't. They don't come to Probably they don't come to Rusty. <laughs> or even to Copenhagen. So, we are in a, in, a, in a time in which the idea of a country project, the idea of building a national type of insertion in the world system, because, you know, different countries enter the different, different, uh, uh, this world system in different ways, is now an accepted idea. And since this basic idea of the university has been taken away from the university, now the university is without Support, because the university used to have a support, a social support, and a political support, and a financial support. They were the elites that provided that. But the elites deserted. That's why it's so easy now to cut the university budget. They're not interested anymore. So the universities have to find an alternative social support. And the alternative social support are really in the social movements, in the impoverished middle classes throughout Europe, immigrants, refugees, all sorts of population, the discardable populations that are growing throughout Europe and throughout the world. So, how can we do that? Well, whenever there was a time of this uh, idea of the world uh, as the universities being part of the building national projects, we could find excellent universities everywhere. But see, if you take the 60s or the 70s of the past century, you go to Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, or you go to Nairobi in Kenya, or you go to Uganda in Makerere, or you go to São Paulo in Brazil, or Universidad Nacional in Bogota, you find, or UNAM in Mexico, you find excellent universities. People coming from different countries. For instance, the most famous sociologists and uh, lawyers and so on taught from the America, from the US, taught in Nairobi, taught in Dar es Salaam. Because there was a, an idea of an internationalism of the universities. The universities, in fact, were very international from the very beginning. The professors in my university in the 13th century would uh, teach in Coimbra, would teach in Salamanca, would teach in Paris, would teach in Bologna. So there was a globalization before the current one. But in effect, this idea of the internationalization of, of, of knowledge was really a very crucial uh, aspect of the university. But all of, a sense, all of a sudden, this changed. Because this internationalism was at the service of consolidating national projects everywhere, in Kenya, in Tanzania, in Mexico, and so on and so forth. Now, this cannot be done because global capitalism, and particularly financial capitalism, is totally against any idea of nationality. Of, uh, the nationality, in fact, is being taken over by the ideas of extreme rights. Because everyone should be against the idea of the idea of a country. Or the country, of course, these projects of a country were very exclusionary. For instance, the idea of a country in, in, in Sao Paulo, in Brazil, the country of Brazil, of course, would not include the indigenous peoples, would not include the Afro-descendants. So they were very exclusionary projects of a country. But they were projects of a country anyway. Well, the Indians, of course, were also very exclusionary. So that was not an ideal world. But it wasn't the, the world on, on the basis of which universities were being created, developed, funded, and a prestige. So now, the idea of this uh, national development, national economies, national capitalism are gone. National bourgeoisie even is gone <laughs> in most countries now. 
So what is the idea? Is that these universities is only an instrument of the market. There can be no other way. See, if the market and knowledge is commodified, the university should be at the service of commodification. And therefore, as your colleague was saying, that's precisely the process. Professors get proletarianized. Students become consumers. And the objective of the education is just employment and jobs. And the market dictates the needs of the university. And therefore, if you are in a recession and so on, we need people. We don't need people in the market if there is so much in unemployment. Probably we don't need universities. So the idea of transforming the university into an enterprise like any other is the most dangerous idea. And we are at the beginning of a process. That is to say, there is room for struggle now. In 10 years' time, probably, there will be no room. And I'll tell you why. Because this idea starts at very different levels. The first level, of course, is uh, an epistemological level that usually goes unnoticed. Is that the value of knowledge is the market value of knowledge. The knowledge that should be promoted at the university should be the kinds of knowledge that have a market value. Ideally, patterns biology and so on. I spend uh, four months of my life every year in the United States at the University of the University of Wisconsin Medicine. Of course there you go through the buildings. I mean the humanities are really being crushed by all the budgetary cuts. But biotechnology, I mean building after building after building after building. Professors have their own enterprises within the university. The more patents more money for the university. So the university integrated into the market. So the market value of the knowledge, of the value of knowledge is the market value of knowledge. So we have to start to do what Gramsci used to say, a war of position, that is to say, a war of hegemony. Knowledge has to have value that is not dictated by the market. There are values, there are knowledges that should have, they have no, market value, and they should have no market value. What is the market value of the humanities, of Latin, of, of, of a high culture, of, of poetry? In some universities, who we'll, don't we'll even have anybody, that even in the humanities, that know Latin or Greek, which used to be the, the founding idea, because they have no market value. Where do they want to go? They want to go much further. This may be quite uh, bad already, but it's going much... If they are allowed to, they will be much worse. What is that? Well, you know the WTO, the, the World Trade uh, Organization. The, we have the round, the, the new round, the, the most recent round. It's actually, now it's paralyzed, but, but it's still there. Is the, the, the DOA round. And the DOA round is based basically on the liberation of education ser of services. Twelve services are going to be liberalized. And education is one of them. And the tertiary education, you know, that's the name of the World Bank for Universities. It's tertiary education. <laughs> they say that is one of the most profitable investments in the future. And therefore, they want to liberalize this commerce of tertiary education. What do they mean? We are going to create a few global universities and these global universities are going to produce packages of courses. For instance, a package of sociology, a package of law, a package of anthropology, and they can sell it everywhere. The package includes professors, evaluation, uh, readings, evaluation, and accreditation. And they can be sold. So if you want your, your rector or in any university will say, well, you know, it's too much expensive now for us uh, to have a sociology course. Let's buy the sociology of Harvard and use it here. So our professors will be, in fact, the TAs. They were people that were at the service of these uh, uh, courses that, in fact, have been produced elsewhere through a system of franchising. They want to franchise courses as they do with McDonald's and this 
Well, that's the idea. Well, it's, it sounds ridiculous. But what these guys have in mind? So they are trying to streamline the universities in such a way that the market is more transparent. So now bibliometrics and ranking. Why are the professors being, and the teachers, proletarianized? In such a way that you know, whatever you do for the community doesn't count for your promotion or for whatever. What counts is your articles in indexed journals. Most of them in English. Even if you have social responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the suburbs here, in fact, you are, uh, you know, promoted on the basis of articles in English. Throughout the world, all of us are taught to, to uh, write in English. It's not difficult for me, but it's difficult for many of my colleagues. We have to spend money in translation, even though our responsibility is for the people in our societies. If I write a book in Portuguese or Spanish, there's much less value than a rubbish article. I never write rubbish articles, but you know, <laughs> not a so, a so good article in an English uh, speaking with an impact journal. You know, 90% of these journals are owned by some company, an American company. Look at the mafia that has been created. And we have discovered. Just to tell you, this is almost a, a George Orwell type of thing. But before we're going to the, don't get too pessimistic, we'll find ways. I <laughs> but, but this is really serious, what is this thing? Can you imagine that in the United States, we have discovered the red networks of agencies that go to the Congresses, to the young scholars, particularly younger scholars that want to be credited and promoted at universities, what they do is to try to find ways in which I know that you wrote an article, so please quote me, and I quote you. And this exchange in quotation, so that the impact index of your articles increases. <laughs> so it doesn't matter whatever you do, the quality of what you do, but the quantity. Where did you publish? Yes, it's important. What did you publish? <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> so this is the situation in which I am. It, it is really... And if this goes on, the universities will end. Because I'm sure that there are many people, young people, who get out, find other ways. We know that Descartes or Spinoza or Kant would never be university professors. How could they? You know, Spinoza never wrote a book. I mean, wrote uh, three or four books, but uh, the guy was, you know, was around here in Hague where he lived. Uh, this guy was the most famous guy in Europe without publishing a book. <laughs> so now if these guys would be telling you have to publish and publish and publish in index journals, I mean, this guy would be done. So, the situation is therefore very complex. And the universities have not yet in our society recognized the threats. I mean, outside the global universities. We, have, we organized one thing that was the Bologna process. I did an evaluation of the Bologna process. I don't know if you are familiar with that. It was a kind of a major reform of the universities. The basic idea of this project was that European universities should compete with the American universities. That was the idea. Because the American universities are very homogeneous in their curriculum structure and so on. While in Europe we had, you know, dozens of university systems. So we have to streamline them and to make them uh, homogeneous to a certain extent. And we did it at huge sacrifices, and we can discuss that in, in, in the debate. So, but this idea was for Europe to compete. What we are witnessing now is this perverse effect, this very bad movement in Europe, is that in fact the global universities, European global universities, most probably will be the universities that have, have not followed the Bologna system. <laughs> London School of Economics, Oxford, Cambridge. Not even Sorbonne will be a global university because of the language. And these are the universities that they will be what they call the first tier universities. The university will be very well funded. There will be no crisis for these universities. There will be no lack of money for them. Then there are the second tier which there will be cuts and so on. And there will be a third tier, which will be completely 
uh, degraded universities in which probably there will be no research anymore. So they'll be just teaching. So this is what they are up to. Can we confront this situation? We should, at least. I mean, it's clear that, that, that we should in name of all kinds of struggles and ideas. I mean, and these ideas are not university ideas. They are ideas of society. The universities, with all their uh, shortcomings, they have been the institutions where critically dependent thinking has been possible. And now they don't want critically independent thinking. And therefore, even these forms of bibliometrics, as you call it, and the rankings, is too streamlined. Because if you really depend on what the referees of a journal say, the referees are all usually very ignorant in general, you know, particularly if you come from a small country. You have to explain everything because they don't know. So all innovation, new ideas, are immediately, well, this is justified. Put references on that. Because they don't know, so they streamline you and prevent your innovation. Because they, they feel threatened by your own innovation. So you are bound to publish what is conventionally publishable. And therefore the critical thinking is gone. Emancipatory thinking and knowledge is gone. So these are the dangers. And I, I think that you have to be very careful about that, and, and we have to pay attention to that. What can we do? I think that these are the four words and four slogans for our, our struggles, and, and everywhere. And I saw your student from a different university uh, to ask for cooperation and, and uh, some international cooperation even. We have to be much broader than that. I mean, we have to not just Denmark, not just the Nordic countries, but students everywhere that are being really uh, 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 going through the same problem, and particularly for the society, uh, for many people that are not even students. But because they need, in fact, that these ideas of critical independent thinking will continue to prosper and will continue to, to develop. Because even when professors now and teachers do research, we, we are witnessing something, for instance, in India, which is quite troubling, and it's coming into Europe. That the, 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 the Indian universities are the kind of a part of the protocols with the state is that they should provide, you know, knowledge to the institutions, to the Minister of Education, to the Minister of Health, to the Minister of Social Security. The idea that society should be closer to, the university should be closer to society. Many ministers now, they don't want university knowledge, professors and teachers and researchers anymore. They contract Deloitte, the consultancy agencies. And the consultancy agencies are the ones that are being, providing the sources for public policy. Why these cuts in Denmark? Why this, why this so similar in all these countries? Because the same companies are behind. The same consultancy companies. And they have the same agenda. And the same agenda is to transform the university into a market. And a very profitable market. So, first move. I think that even before the four uh, words, I think that we have to find, uh, as a resistance, a counter-hegemonic globalization. I've been writing uh, extensively, as you know, I was one of the founders of the World Social Forum, <coughs> of the, and, and I'm very active in the World Social Forum. In fact, I invite all of you to come to Tunis. We'll be in Tunis from the 24th of March to the 31st of March. And in fact, one of the sessions that we are going to organize is on the popular university of the social movements in which we are bringing together scholars from the university with leaders of social movements. That's a proposal that I'm going to make right now in this lecture, or this presentation. But counter-hegemonic globalization alone, you won't survive. You have to develop links with other universities, with other student organizations across the country and internationally, and north and south, because people are living through the same, but the our situations are very opaque. 
I didn't know before this very moment the situation was killed as was explained by your students. Because these things don't come into the news. The mainstream media, even if I get informed, I don't get this type of information. So counter-hegemonic globalization and later nationalization is absolutely important. The second idea is that the universities have to find an alternative social support because the elites are not there anymore. Particular universities in which you know they are not they have no intent even or possibility of reaching the global university status, right? So if this is so. Where is this alternative social support? I think we have to open up to the society to be much, much more transparent and to be much more socially responsible. And we have to do that as students and as professors, even as staff. Basically, the new social class or social basis for the universities will be the impoverished middle classes with an interest in culture, with an interest in knowledge, with an interest in alternative thinking, in also all the excluded, and Europe is becoming a fortress of exclusion, of undocumented migrant workers, of concentration camps for asylum seekers, of uh, Islamophobia, of racism, and of course of social exclusion of labor markets. Because in fact in employment, look, the youth in Spain, 29% are unemployed in your age. The best of my country, which took 20 years to train highly qualified young people. Where are they now? In the United States? In India? Everywhere? You? You are, you are here? <laughs> yes. you know, we could not keep them. So we did all the investment and now other countries are benefiting from this investment. So this is part of the expropriation that capitalism usually does. Always from the poor to the rich, never the, from the rich to the poor. So Tolstoy in 1917 said one thing that is still as valid. In fact, many people in the Occupy movement speak of the 1% and 99%. You know, they think they invented this. This was invented by Leo Tolstoy. <laughs> and it's in diaries, 17 of August, 1910, 1917. You can confirm that. So I think that this social base forces us to inquire into our curriculum and in our plan of studies. What type of projects can we intersect with social groups in our society? And here we have two measures which in my view are absolutely crucial. One is much more conventional than the other. The first one is what we used to call extension. That is to say, take the university out to the society. Take the examples, usually I'm very much in favor of what I call realistic utopias. That is to say, things that are being done already. For instance, in Canada, there is a very important movement of the universities, in Quebec particularly, but in other parts, in which these universities, as their job, and they manage to have in the city, and sometimes in the suburbs, in the least qualified, socially qualified suburbs, the great and middle class, the poor middle class, they organize sessions of popular university, which is basically the idea you may, I mentioned before, one other days before, but now it's just the people in the community say, we would like to know what neoliberalism is. We would like to know what a university is. We'd like to know what bioepigenetics uh, and difference between gen gen genetics and epigenetics, which is a crucial distinction to that. And we don't know. And we don't get that from, from mainstream. So they organize every two weeks for two hours at the end of the afternoon in which people uh, come, people from the city, and it's very well organized between the, the suburbs and the, and the regions of the city, their own organizations, and the university. And it is a learning process for the professors and for the students because very often the students also mobilize themselves to do this because you know, if you are a little already, if you are at a, a PhD level, for instance, or even not at that level, you know a lot about the topics. You are not allowed to teach because you are supposed to be a student. But in fact, you know more than, than you think. So, these ideas of extension, 
in terms of education, in terms of all the social policies, are absolutely important. But the most important yet is what I call extension in the reverse. That is to say, we don't have to take the university out. We have to bring society in. And in fact, capitalism has done that. And we really didn't pay attention. Look at the council now that run the universities in our society. Most of them are business people. Even directors are surrounded by businessmen. Usually men, not even. <laughs> and that's the logic. And it's everywhere. Again, the same consultancy firms organize the same structure coming from Europe. Europe now is an iron cage for innovation in Europe. Unless we reinvent it altogether. So how do we do that? Bring outside knowledge into the university. Again, examples. In Brazil, School of Medicine, for instance, in Amazonia, they bring the traditional healers and doctors to the university. Not as raw material, but as proper knowledge, as an alternative knowledge, a different knowledge, <coughs> And this enters very well in my epistemology of the epistemology of the South, book just came out with that title, Epistemology of the South, in the United States, is the idea of ecology of knowledge. We are absolutely Eurocentric and monocultural and mono-epistemologically uh, uh, speaking. We don't allow for the pluriverse of knowledge, plurality of knowledge in the experience. And particularly, you don't, we don't allow, and we, professors and students, are responsible for that. Because of our past with the elites, we are too comfortable with the elites. We are not anymore. So, what kind of knowledge do we teach at the universities? The knowledge of the winners, never the knowledge of the losers. That's why the epistemologists of the South are knowledge born in struggle. struggle by the experience of people that have suffered colonialism, capitalism, and patriarchy. The three main modes of domination in our society. And if you look at that, the usually the knowledge of the losers never comes to the university. In Africa there is a famous saying that I think we should bear in mind all the time. It says that the history of Africa has been written by the hunter, not by the leopard. One day, when the leopard writes its own history, it will be a different history of Africa. In fact, the history of Africa has been an history of colonial administrators for a long, long time. Now, things are changing, but it's a very long process. So can we bring ecology of knowledges into the university? Not university knowledges, but popular knowledges. Europe is so rich in interculturality, but is really excluding it altogether. We were not, because of colonialism and because of immigration that is very much related to it, to colonialism, particularly in my case, in the country of old Portugal, that these rich social and cultural experiences are completely marginalized and excluded, but there are resistances. And these are the resistance I'd like to pay attention to. For instance, another example from Brazil, in the south part of Brazil, in Paraná, there was the idea that in the south there are no black people, no Afro-descendants. They were invisible, but they were there. One of the topics of my epistemology is what I call sociology of absences. How do we make people invisible? Through an abyssal line that whatever is on the other side of the line is not visible. <laughs> Well, the, the black movement has managed to really win this battle. There are Afro-descendants in Paraná, and they have a different culture, and these knowledges and practices, and this should be also valued in, uh, at the university. Can you imagine that now in the humanities there is one co optional course on threadlocks, on, uh, on doing the air in the African way? And this is a tremendous transformation of the university and of the, the self-esteem of people. Because you know what many people in Brazil, and not only in Brazil, in Europe, people that have the, you know, the, the, the 
African Harris used to be called. Because usually they would use chemical products that are very destructive for the health. Not to seem so African. This is a form of racism upon the bodies, the bodies that suffer. The bodies that we never can really gave attention in our knowledge because we are children of Descartes. We take care of the souls, not of the, of the bodies. But the bodies suffer. They are the ones that suffer. And suffer silently. So bring this diversity into the university and everything changes. So I think this, this was what I call decolonizing. Democratizing goes into the decolonizing. Today, for instance, in my course, I teach Ibn Khaldun as a founder of sociology. Ibn Khaldun is a great, great thinker of the 14th century. In fact, my lecture is in Portuguese. You can, well, the ones that can be Portuguese, is, it will be on my project, Alice, after tomorrow. How come that this great thinker, born in Tunis, could be really a founder of social sciences? And you look at this introduction to universal history, is the best knowledge that you can imagine about. You cannot understand Libya or Syria without reading Ibn Khaldun. Durkheim knew uh, Ibn Khaldun. The concept of solidarity that is basically uh, a basic concept for Durkheim, he got it from Khaldun, but never acknowledged that. Because how could the Europeans learn from a thinker that first is Africa, secondly is Islam, Islam, Muslim, who is neither a terrorist nor an extremist, <laughs> <laughs> and was born in 1332. So the wealth of knowledge that is out there is immense, and our universities are hyper-selective, and in fact are becoming more and more so, and Bologna is part of that. The diversity of curriculum all over Europe is diminishing, because of the tightening up of the curriculum. I teach at one, at one college here in London, Burbank College, in which if you write a master thesis with more than 70 pages, is not accepted. Can you imagine that? So you are reduced, degrading the masters. In the United States, so we don't even give master's degrees anymore. Only PhDs. So we degrade all the degrees. Now we, we still have the, the doctorate. But in 10 years' time, they'll find a fourth cycle. Because the idea is to continue the same, impoverishing, degrading the previous cycles. So that, that is to say, we are more illiterate when you get the first cycle, more illiterate when you get second cycle and third cycle. So on. And then they add up others. Now we call it post-doctorate. But you know, they'll invent some, something else. So I think that the decolonizing of our knowledge is absolutely important. And this, uh, I could give you lots of examples of how many we have to revise history. You know, it is very important that we had an industrial revolution. All of us believe that in fact, and it's true, what really transformed Europe into a kind of a living and therefore a capitalist a world power was the Industrial Revolution in 1930. This is very important. But why is it not so important in our universities to teach our students that until 1830, 50% of the international commerce was Chinese, was run by China. All our kings, all the types of uh, 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 furniture they had came from China. Why this is not taught, even to our Chinese students here in the United States. So that they cannot understand that, in fact, the reason why China is coming back is because it, it was a way just for between 1830 and 2000. It's, in Chinese terms, it's a very short period. But we don't understand that. It is very important that the Portuguese and the Spanish discovered the New World, America. But is it also not very important to know that Chinese were there decades before? That they discovered the Pacific Rim we have now. 
absolutely evident that Chen Ho, you know, leading huge naval uh, ships, they discovered America on the Pacific. They didn't occupy, <laughs> but they were there. <laughs> Is it very important that we did the, the modern revolution? Copernicus and Galileo and so on, very important. But it's not equally important to know that particular Tycho Brahe from this area, a predecessor and precursor of the astronomy, got his data from Sanskrit texts. Because the heliocentric theory was in Sanskrit already. That is to say, we live in this illusion that the European culture is different and is absolutely exceptional because it's the only universal. But what we don't pay attention is that all the Greek philosophy is originated in Alexandria, in Egypt. And the philosopher had a much darker skin than the skin that shows up now in the statues and in the paintings. Persia and North Africa. And this idea that Greek was different comes from 1845. It's very recent. So we have to revise all the history. So we have to decolonize the social science, not to, of course, put aside all the knowledge. I mean, you know, I was trained in Marxism. I mean, Marxism is a great scholar. And Weber is a great scholar. Durkheim is a great scholar. All of these people are very great scholars. But there are other knowledges that we have to bring in. Can you imagine the reason why I came up and we have a, a, a chapter that you'll be uh, uh, enjoying reading that I try to explain why the social theories that we study at our universities were created by four or five scholars, all men, in three countries, in Europe, to solve the problems of Europe. When you look at social struggles today, most of the people are absent there. Women are absent of critical theory. They are absent of Marx, for instance, or Durkheim or Weber. Indigenous people are absent. History, it's not even history. I mean, for, for, uh, for uh, Africa, and for Hegel, they are outside history. The African mind is so primitive that it's outside history. Can we imagine? These ideas still go on. And, uh, they have been responsible for us to reinvent social theory so that all these invisible groups are the ones that are leading the struggles. That's why we have, and I think that we have to do, to do a lot because we have also to depatriarchalize. Look at this audience. The majority are women. The leaders were all men. <laughs> this is absolutely common. This is absolutely common. Why is that? Go to the social movements. Who does the work in the social movements? Very often the women. But then the leaders are men. And I praise the leaders. I mean, there's nothing against personally against any of these leaders. Great leaders. Um, but, you know, I think that we have to pay attention to this. I mean, otherwise we reproduce patriarchy. That's why I think we need also to do the patriarchal. So the demo democracy, that's the last, uh, the last aspect. Decommodification, quite frankly, is obvious. I mean, we have, in fact, to fight rankings. We have, in fact, to claim the knowledge that there's no market value. And to say that, aside from the market, there are other things in society. Because even the liberal theory, it's very interesting to know this. You know that liberal theory, liberal political theory, had a very interesting distinction in terms of values. There are values, you know, values, valuable things, that cannot be sold or thought or, or, or bought. There are our convictions, political convictions, religious convictions. And there are values that can be bought and sold in the market, commodities. What is happening in our societies is that the two are in fusion now, that everything can be bought and sold. That's why we have endemic corruption in politics. Because the values that cannot be sold or bought are not there anymore. 
Precisely because the university also have to work for the market. So everything that favors the market is, of course, praised. Democratization. I think we have to go beyond the idea is just the governing of the university. I think we have to democratize the curriculum. We have to democratize the types of things that we learn in our schools. And then, yes, there are things in which the students have much more knowledge than professors. I have my experience all over has been in that way. Because it is very clear, and a great philosopher that is absolutely forgotten from the 14th century here in Europe, Nicolaus of Cusas, that says that any system of knowledge is also a system of ignorance. When we teach some knowledge, we are in fact made people ignorant about alternative knowledges. Sometimes their own knowledges, and our university that brings so many people from outside Europe these days, there is no intention in our university to value our students that come from China, from India, from Africa, from Latin America. This is almost a, an epistemicide, a destruction of knowledge that we do on a systematic way. I, uh, I, I can't resist telling you a story of my research in Colombia. I was doing a research in the end of the 90s. And uh, one of my research assistants was uh, an Indian, an indigenous person from uh, Rwaka. And she was in, uh, going to the law school. And one day she arrived in my office crying. I said, Elizabeth was the Eurocentric name. Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Professor, no, why are you crying? Well, you know, I was in the civil, in civil uh, law course, civil code. And the professor was saying, you know, we have, uh, for the ones, there's probably no, no one in, in law, but you know, there is this uh, distinction between movable and immovable products, uh, commodities. You know, a house is immovable, you know, land and fields and so on are immovable, and then this is movable and so on. So all these distinctions are important, but bear in mind, all of them can be bought and sold. And you have, whenever you buy it, you have a title. This is a legal title of property, individual property. So you can do that with land, with houses, with products, and so on. She raised her hand and said, Professor, in my community, we cannot own the land because we are owned by the land. The land does not belong to us. We belong to the land. So we cannot buy or sell it. Professor told her, I'm teaching the civil code. I don't care about any other things that exist in our society. <laughs> she was so devastated by this arrogance. So this professor, at the same time that he was teaching and giving her the knowledge of code civil, was producing knowledge, the ignorance, was telling her that your knowledge of your community is of no value. I don't care about that. And I told her, Elizabeth, I mean, you, you will be better than your teacher. <laughs> Because you are learning the civil code, it's very important that you learn even to defend your community. But then you also know your own law in your own community. And even we have a name for that, this legal pluralism. The idea that there are different plural, different legal systems in any society, even in Denmark there are. I, I have a colleague of mine that, not here, but in Sweden, Barbara Ingerson, that wrote a marvelous piece, an anthropologist, on the fishing of the law of the uh, fishing uh, villages uh, in, uh, in Sweden. So we have all these legal pluralities that we don't recognize here. So the last uh, proposal is what I call the popular university of social movements. I think that Roskilde could be a good place and probably the students uh, are a good, uh, a good uh, protagonists of that. What is that? In 2003 at the World Social Forum, I, uh, I've noticed two things, uh, which I think you have noticed, and your student leaders already mentioned that here. First is that a huge divorce between academic knowledge and popular knowledges, uh, rural knowledge, peasant knowledges, indigenous knowledges, urban knowledges, people outside. They have knowledge. Most of the people run their lives without scientific knowledge. So they must have some knowledge. So this divorce. The second one is the divorce about uh, among the social movements. If I'm a feminist, 
I think that my, my struggle is more important than your struggle in labor classes. If I'm a working class activist, I think that the labor uh, activism and the working class activism is more important than women's uh, struggles. And uh, if I'm an indigenous person, I think that my indigenous struggle is more important than gays and lesbians. And we create prejudices among the social movements. And that's why you don't unite. And we have to really bring in different social movements for a conversation, because after all, all of them have been really dominated either by capitalism, colonialism, or patriarchy. But why are they so separated? I could tell you immense stories of these among movements. So we decided to bring together different movements for workshops. And uh, I have the, you can go to the page of the, the Popular University, and uh, I have here, it's in a, in, including Arabic, so you have all kinds of language. This is not a Danish, but you can produce, students could produce a, a Danish version of this. And we are going to work on it also in the World Social Forum. What is this? It's very simple. It's a workshop that lasts for two days, in which one-third of the people, the participants, are university <laughs> professors, artists, students, people in the academic life. And two-thirds are leaders of social movements. But they have to be different social movements. Indigenous peasants with women, uh, women with uh, human rights, ecologists with these workers, exactly for us to discuss our differences. Because why some people use emancipation? Other movements don't like emancipation, they speak of liberation. Some people speak of, of, of human rights, other people speak of dignity. When we, two years ago, when we are proposing the World Social Forum, uh, of course, the idea of human rights, you know, are, you know, you know, Arab Spring, and we have to really organize the World Social Forum on human rights. Then we start holding some meetings with people from North Africa. I said, are you crazy? Coming to Africa to organize the World Social Forum on the basis of human rights. Don't you know that in 1798, I knew many people didn't know actually, when Napoleon invaded Cairo, he did that in the name of human rights. Because if you read the proclamation, and read that proclamation, I have an extract in a, another book is coming out, is the, uh, If God Were a Human Rights Activist. And then in that book, what I say, I bring in is this aggression by the name of human rights. So because the proclamation of Napoleon is a, a beautiful document. They say that we can be at war press you and so no. We are taking, liberating you from the oppression in the name of human rights. So human rights in North Africa is uh, external invasion, is imposition, is connected with colonialism. So we discussed for several days, what could be the term that could unite us in this general topic? <coughs> and the term was dignity. And that's why the topic of the World Social Forum in 2012 was dignity and not human rights. Because dignity is very important in the Quran, it's several times used in the Quran, and also is very important for the indigenous cosmovisions, the idea of respect, the idea of dignity. They don't speak about socialism, of course. They speak about dignity and respect and Mother Earth. So that was the debate. So, Intercultural translation. How much intercultural translation do we do in our universities? Almost none. So, there is lots of tasks ahead. Please don't be intimidated. There are lots of tasks, but we have to, we cannot change the world for next, tomorrow. But I think that we have to bear this in mind. This has some alternative. The idea that there is no alternative is the most damaging idea that you face today in our world. And in order to identify alternatives, we have not just to show these alternatives that I just mentioned to you. We have to produce an alternative thinking of alternatives. And this is the task of a non-commodified university. Thank you very much. I have one question regarding uh, your epistemology. You speak of this uh, uh, ecology of knowledges, which is an alternative to the monoculture of 
Eurocentric science. Now, my question is this, and I've been wondering about this for a while. When we finally get this ecology of knowledges, how do we then know which of these knowledges are actually useful or actually valuable? How do we know that one person's knowledge is actually valuable and another one is not? Do we even know? Is it all relative? Or are there some criteria that we then use to distinguish between what would then be knowledge and not knowledge? Or is that distinction even present at all in the social ecology of knowledge? Thank you. We can probably collect two or three questions and then I ask them. <coughs> Any more of this over there? First of all, I would like to uh, say thank you for a really great uh, presentation, a really great lecture. Um, there's a lot of people here. And I wanted to ask, uh, you talked about patriarchy and also that patriarchy within the movement. Uh, the other day was too, uh, we were having a, a discussion regarding the European Student Union, where they actually took five patriarchy. They asked, uh, they have a gender balance, um, a mandatory gender balance in their in the board, meaning that the board has to be 50% women and 50% men. Is it a good solution to fight for patriarchy to actually recognize that there is actually gender? Or, I mean, is this a good procedure because you're actually in this way recognizing that there is actually gender and there is a gender distinction? Or should you actually just find a like middle uh, proposals like gender balance? Does that make sense? Yeah. One more. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you have any thoughts about the current negotiation process of the TCIP trade agreement between uh, Europe and mm. the USA regarding the modification of colonial processes. Mm. Very good. A woman, please. <laughs> Okay, hi, I'm Teresa. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> kind of thing. I, have, I have a question. Uh, please, yeah. Out of a sense of curiosity. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have a question. I was wondering if you see an, um, an urban bias in regards to where important decisions are taken and where important knowledge is generated. I have a feeling that uh, sort of uh, capitals and big cities uh, the place to be and where, it, where it's most sort of um, justified to be and, and so if, if you're living well we're a university that's not in a big city we're a university that's actually rural a, a little bit so is this university less legitimate because we're not in, in a big city and are the people who are not living in the city less legitimate than the people who are living in the city? Mm -hmm. Okay, do you want me to answer this set? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the, 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 very, the, all the four questions are very good questions. The first one on the college of knowledge is, well, no, I mean, uh, uh, the, the, usually that's the, the question. I mean, if you bring a plurality of knowledge, then you are trapped by relativism. You know, anything goes, the title of Bob Feyerabend's uh, book on epistemology, and therefore there is no other way of distinguishing. Knowledges. From a critical theory, and that is to say for people that are interested in the emancipatory type of social transformation, relativism is out of question. I mean, you, you cannot take weight all kinds of knowledge. So you have to bring all kinds of knowledges, but then you have to accept some criteria. And the criteria are political. That is to say, if I want to go to the moon, I need scientific knowledge. If I want to preserve the biodiversity of Amazonia, I need indigenous knowledge. So for different purposes, I, de I need different knowledges. And therefore, you have to bring what a, a great American philosopher, John Dewey, uh, developed as the pragmatist. And before him, William James. That is to say, in fact, 
knowledge in our society is what neoliberalism is doing. It's, it's knowledge for the market. I mean, they are very pragmatic. And we have not come up with the idea. That's why you are so defensive. Because they say knowledge for the market, then we say knowledge for knowledge. No, knowledge for social transformation, for a, a more just society, for a free society, for some people call us a socialist society. I mean, we have to really develop other alternative criteria, pragmatic criteria for knowledge. That's the only way you can avoid relativism. Because otherwise, you are in the liberal trap like Richard Rorty. I mean, you know, you, you are paralyzed. And in the end, you say liberal societies are the best trap. Well, uh, uh, concerning patriarchy, I mean, it's, 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 it's a complex, even the concept of patriarchy is a little bit problematic today. Uh, if you are more familiar with uh, the queer theory, for instance, right? And all the questions of sexualizing bodies. Because there are uh, ways in which today there is thinking about bodies uh, that we could call the pansexuality, in which people don't have to define their own sexes in their own social, interpersonal life. And sometimes the patriarchy is a bit reductive because sometimes it's uh, connected with heterosexuality and, you know, usual values in our society. I think we have to do a critique of patriarchy in terms of queer theory. I, I think so. But patriarchy in, in itself is something that is so material in our societies that in fact we have to fight it in the ways women with gender identification in fact continue to be discriminated in our society. Look at the most recent re uh, reports from the OECD. Even the women that are in the same jobs get 30% less than men, a salary. So gender discrimination is very strong in Europe, not just in the rest of the world. There are different ways of discriminating against women, but here in Europe, we have our own ways, very serious ways, because we think that they are, we are a society uh, in which uh, uh, women have uh, obtained all the rights. It's not true. You know, 40% of members of the parliament in Mozambique are women. In my parliament, in Portugal, are 8%. Because it was a politics, a policy of the Frelimo party to bring at least 30% 30% of the women. Having said that, what about the 50% and about these quarters of women and so on? But it's in my Alice project for the European Research Council. Uh, I have to be very careful in that respect because we have to be really, it's, it's good, it's positive because sometimes we bring people, for instance, we have one, uh, if you go to the page on Alice, I'll give you, I'll, I'll leave my card here for, uh, for the students and the leaders of the students can distribute it or, or Julia. We have, and Julie, because Julie is joining us in this, in this project, we have, for instance, one topic is the masters of the world. People that, in fact, have taught something by their own practice to the world, and they are never acknowledged as such, as masters, because some of them are illiterate throughout the world. We are bringing in these people. Others are very erudite and very scholarly persons, like even Haldon. But in fact, we should have a balance between men and women. And I think it's very positive. It has to teach us what the sociology of absence is. Because the women are there, but, but they are invisible. There are lots of women that are masters of the world. In Africa, in Asia. Particularly in Africa, we have a, one of our books came out by, by, by Verso, is the, the Voices of the World. Many of the activists are women. In Mozambique, there are two women, for instance. Fabulous women. And they barely write and read. But they are the leaders, for instance, that solve conflicts within their communities. They are the ones that have been promoting the women in, uh, in, in their movements. So I think to have women and these ideas of parity are just part of the solution, but they are not the solution. Because what we have seen, for instance, this is also the other side of, uh, I could mention, or Mozambique or some, Afri some uh, uh, Latin American countries now, Ecuador and so on, is that if women come to power but exert the power in very much the same way as men, what would we gain? We expanded the oppressors. 
basically. <laughs> but we didn't solve oppression. So I think that it's very important that the women's movement keep this idea that the difference, the discrimination, which is an historical discrimination, the longest in, in history, is to produce other types of leadership. Cannot be the same. Even in democracy, for instance, they are very active in assembly democracy, which is nice, it's very important. But if they go to a parliament, they may be as uh, ignorant about other things as men. So this is, again, it's tricky. It is, of course, a, a serious mistake to put a, 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 a more strict standard on women than on men. As we do sometimes with indigenous people, we think that all the indigenous people have to be pure, there is no corruption among indigenous peoples, and so on. Of course there are. There are women, we, humans. So we cannot put a higher standard. But at the same time, we need differences in our world. And I want to know what the women can contribute to fight against colonialism, capitalism, and patriarchy. Because some women also, whenever in power, they are patriarchal. So I'm an anti-essentialist, uh, in a sense. I, I, I always try to judge by the types of the struggle. If, if, I know that you raise your hand, but can I finish the, the answer and then I'll go? To the transatlantic, I mean, it's the most damaging initiative in Europe. I mean, nobody on the left can subscribe to this. Because I don't know what that is. Is the, the transatlantic uh, investment and commerce, uh, commerce partnership is a free trade agreement between Europe and the United States. It's going to create the largest market in the world. It's precisely what the United States tried to do with Latin American countries through a famous process called ALCA. And ALCA was defeated in Latin America through a very important continent type of resistance. Here in Europe, we have no fight against this visible one. The social democratic parts, even the socialist parts, are in favor of this rubbish. Why this is wrong for us? Because it's basically the multinational corporations running the European economy from now onwards. What they want basically, and if you look to Brussels, look, because they're very good, if there are social scientists or political scientists here, there are good, art, good uh, uh, research projects and, and research work on the lobbyists in Brussels and Strasbourg. The multinational corporations of the United States, because they are from the United States, the rating agencies, are all of them lobbying for this. Because what's going to happen is that there are many things that is poisonous that we don't consume in Europe and we are going to consume. For instance, we don't consume American meat in, in Europe. Because it's, in fact, it's, I don't consume it even when I'm in the United States. Because it's lot is so much fueled with hormones that it's very dangerous. And it's proven, like the McDonald's, you know, fast rubbish that we have here. I mean, they really create obese people and they are cancerous. Well, from now on, if an ecological movement here in Europe try in terms of health to forbid this type of production or this type of meat in a supermarket, or if the transgenic, well, because you know the transgenic, uh, seeds are only allowed in Europe on an experimental basis. If they are going, because with this, they are going to put transgenic seeds all over the place. What are the consequences for human beings of the transgenic food? We don't know for sure, but we know that small animals are killed by the transgenic seeds. Go to Argentina, to the Pampa. And I cross from Cordoba to Rio Cuarto, and this was uh, usually very diversified fields. Now it's just soybeans. It was the center of production of honey in, uh, in, in Argentina. The bees disappeared. So they were killed by these seeds, the pollen. So Europe is going to be subjected to this. And therefore, is, this is one side. There are many other sides. For instance, the fact that if your government is a progressive government and says something that is considered an obstacle to market, 
is not your courts that are going to decide. It's arbitration courts based in, in New York or in London in which the arbitrators are people from the, these companies or worked for the companies in the past. So this is a disaster for Europe because the European Commission, do you know what, and you have to be very clear about that. Neoliberalism would be very difficult to penetrate Europe given the political structure of different countries with communist parties. In my country, the communist party still gets 8% of the vote. And uh, Portuguese have been voting overwhelmingly on the left, but divided, and the, the right governs. This is common in other countries. But it would be impossible to have a neoliberal on, on food, on services, on national level. What they did was to enter through the European Commission. Neoliberalism in Europe, content to other countries, entered surreptitiously through the Maastricht uh, uh, Treaty, through the Central Bank. It was through Europe and now is covered in the directives for the countries. That was the trap. And we didn't see the trap. So that's why, in time, that's why we have to do some uh, think uh, about that, but you know, I'm absolutely negative. I'm only surprised why we don't do that. I'm surprised why the leftist groups and movements don't support it. Greece and Syriza, where this is a very important demand that the Germans pay the damages of the Nazis. Reparations for the Nazi government. We have figures. There are courts that decide the amount. And Syriza is fighting that alone. Geopolitics of knowledge. Your question is about geopolitics of knowledge. That is to say, central knowledge, central cities, central countries, and so on. This is part of the trap of hegemonic knowledge. In fact, there is a geopolitics that you have to unravel and to decide what to do with it. What you have to do is that if you look closely, most of the innovation in science and in politics came from the peripheries, not from the center. We are learning in Europe now, for instance, about participatory democracy in the municipalities. Where does the idea come from? From Porto Alegre, from a Brazilian city in the 90s. So there are innovations that come from the peripheries and eventually, if there is political will, they come to the center. But the geopolitics is part of capitalism, set the periphery. Well, we have North Europe, South Europe. We have all, all the time this geopolitics. Okay. Another round of questions? There, there are already two. Before, yeah, actually, you answered it perfectly. It's just that you mentioned um, we talked about the women who, when they get power. Mike, do you hear? No, sorry. When, women, when they get power, mm -hmm. sorry, when, when women come into power, they kind of fill out the, the spots that men wait for. So we want to get the female values. The female values is very difficult to bring forward. Like you have to enter a patriarchal society and all their spots. And that is why it's so difficult for women sometimes to push forward. My femi feminine, not feminist, but feminine mm. values are not really important in the big game. Or that's how sometimes I would feel. And, but we also have many men who have these feminine values. It's not about gender, man or woman. It's just the feminine values, I think. But you also mentioned it afterwards. So thank you very much. That was... Uh Okay. Um, when we speak of ecologies of knowledge, when we speak of inter-epistemic dialogues and intercultural translation and so on, there is two questions that I have, or rather three. But the first one is how do we define the borders and the limits of each epistemology and the borders that separates them and prevent them to have a dialogue. Then the second question is, what according to you are the political and economic conditions for such a dialogue to take place so that it is a dialogue and not a monologue like it usually is? And um, touching on what you were talking about, your work on the founding, founder of a social theory from Tunisia, um, how do we, in that dialogue, also try to find the points of interactions? Because it's always as if Europe hasn't learned anything from the world, but they have been doing that for centuries and centuries, but they just don't accept they have been doing that. 
and they don't want to do it now. Yeah. So that, those are good questions. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm also a part of a uh, different university and uh, I want to touch about uh, upon, like the struggle for another university and also as I see it, uh, there is the struggle for another university is also a part of the struggle for, for another society as I see it. It's, uh, it's not uh, what you call it, the two different subjects, but it's very uh, interconnected. Um, and that's also like, like the, the part where we have to, to uh, be very specific and, and brought it out in a, in a broad perspective, I see. Uh, right now, we see like, uh, we could see it as capitalism, as a whole system, as also we touched upon. It's a, it's a, in a historical decline, it's, a, it's basically a, a sick system. So the, you can see like the, the ruling ideas right now is to try to get profit from places you, where you didn't get profit from before and like try to squeeze you know, money out of uh, every corner of society. And that's why we also see like, uh, this uh, process of uh, how business is invading the university and is trying to, uh, to, uh, to turn it into, a, as you said, a, a new McDonald's <laughs> in some way. Uh, and I think that's like that's a very uh, important thing to to remember to have like this broad perspective uh, for the struggle for another university or for a different uh, university, uh, and also just to to look at for, for inspiration from from other places from uh, uh, May '68 uh, in, in France uh, about the student struggle there, who turned into the to the biggest um, what you call it the strike movement, uh, the history at that time. Also to look at the, the, the more recently uh, Arab, uh, Arabic uh, revolutions where it was also started by the youth and by the students who, could, who couldn't get any job, who was the, treated like the products. I also think we, we have to see our struggle like that and have to see our struggle in a broad perspective and also see that, as, uh, that we have to turn the struggle into a struggle with revolutionary com uh, implications for the whole system as a whole. Uh, and and we like in this in the different uni university we are a small group, but you know if you have to change the university and change all society, you have to start at the <laughs> at some place. So uh, I would like to uh, ask everybody to, to come and join to talk to one of us afterwards, so uh, we can be a broader movement and uh, be a part of the of, of uh, our protest uh, on the in next week Friday next week uh, where the 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 board will. Uh, Will uh, uh, lay off some uh, some uh, some staff at the university. Uh, yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was uh, very inspired by the um, ecology of knowledge, uh, but I was wondering, like. Practically, in a sense, how to do this because I think it's super interesting, and I would like to join the struggle and <clears throat> I like to resist in this way. But how how do you uh, deal with other knowledges uh, in an institution where you're measured in certain ways uh, that does not necessarily carry these types of knowledges? This one over there, and then. Hi, my name is Erica. Thank you so much for your lecture. Um, I'm from California and I grew up in a working class immigrant community. And when I got to the university, I noticed that uh, there's a certain formality in academia. And uh, most of the time, the way research is conducted, it's conducted very mainstream. I mean, uh, the education system is very, uh, it's already, you know, it's already commodified in the U.S. And so I was wondering how can we make the uh, information that we conduct as you know students, as scholars, more accessible to communities, especially you know underprivileged, underserved you know uh, communities, not just from the global south, but also you know poor communities, because I feel like a lot of the times the language that is used in academia isn't you know readily accessible. And I know you talked a lot about uh, popular <coughs> education, and maybe provide uh, there are other some like examples of how it's being utilized and also how do we maintain this integrity 
and make sure that, you know, the stories that we are telling, we're not just, you know, uh, utilizing the same, you know, almost colonial aspects in our own research when we do do research with these communities. Thank you. Okay, another set of uh, very, very interesting questions. Let's see if I can answer. Well, your first comment, in fact, I had answered it, but it is true that, for instance, in this project, the Alice project, we are very much concerned about uh, non-capitalist economies. And uh, one is what we call economy of care. And the economy of care has a disproportionate presence of women throughout the world. And uh, what we mean by the economy of care, there are people that have been working on this, is uh, of course the business and paid labor and so on, but is looked up by us as forms of uh, exchanges without monetary uh, 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 transcription, I would say, uh, based on solidarity and reciprocity. And this uh, is what we call very often the informal civil society, that is to say, the, the networks of uh, mutual aid in which women, for instance, participate so much. And what is the value of that? Uh, how do we bring that into the value system of the society since it doesn't count for the, the GDP? And what does not count for the GDP does not exist. So I think that, uh, that uh, your comment makes all sense. Concerning the ecology of knowledge, there are two questions and I answer them uh, uh, jointly. Well, the first one is that how to define the borders. Yeah, it, well, it's always a problem. Uh, it's, it's a problem that has to be solved in concrete terms everywhere. Why? Because even what comes as scientific is also not so clear. Uh, we, in the epistemology and sociology of science, we distinguish between internal plurality and external plurality of science. Internal plurality is the diversity of theorizing within uh, uh, the field of science. And there are alternative theories everywhere. I mean, if you take, you know, it was, uh, take the, the work of some feminist epistemologists, uh, Don Haraway, Sandra Harding, for instance, they really uh, showed that most of the theories that were validated by, by science were male-oriented theories. And a beautiful analysis of Darwin, for instance, on the origin of species. Why competition, not cooperation? For instance. So there is internal plurality, you know, and there is external plurality, that is to say, between science and other knowledges. And here, of course, the, the borders are not, we have not to be very anxious about you know, is this scientific, non scientific. Because what counts as, as science is part of a community, is, is what is relevant for a community as science. And therefore, changes all the time, changes from country to country. And therefore, we have to do contextual analysis. For instance, if I do an ecology of knowledge here, it will be different from if I conduct it in another country. I mean, the idea of bringing different knowledge is there, but what counts as scientific knowledge, there are communities that are much more enclosed than science, let's say, while others are many, much more porous. And there are fields of science which are more porous. For instance, biology, particularly through the epigenetics, it forces us to always be in between disciplines. And therefore, even the, the, the borders are very fuzzy. We are in the European Union, there was something that was very creative uh, at the time were the boutiques of science. Uh, there was the idea that in some, so even in Copenhagen that existed one, there were points in which for certain project, for this urban development, we put together scientists with citizens of the community to discuss conceptions of urbanization by urbanists and by citizens. So here you can see that in this case it's very clear whose knowledge you are discussing. But again, it's, it's contextual. It's, it's never something that, um, that, uh, that you can take for granted. There is no recipe. There is to say science is this and the rest is non-science. It's, it's, it's fuzzy all the time. Well, the point of interaction, of course we have to, you know, if you take, uh, you know, you, you, you have to avoid in, in many of our studies, uh, in particular, you mentioned even Caldon, avoid anachronism because one can trash immediately even Caldon and say, what did he think about women? My answer, yes, of course, 
he thought that women were not on the same level of men. But all the European thinkers at that time thought the same way. It's not because he's Islamic or because he was in Tunis, because all the philosophers that we praise, and his neighbor, a great doctor of the church called St. Augustine, yeah. you know, which is an African, in fact, and was is born in Ipo, very close to Tunis, right? Well, the same, for, for him, is the same idea uh, of women as, as even Khaldun. But one is a doctor of the church and the other is a, a almost forgotten Islamic uh, scholar. So, your, your comment, Jan, yeah, from our student, uh, well, I, I, it's very important that different student movements get together. And, uh, you know, one problem of the left has been factionalism. <laughs> and it's the most uh, destructive tradition in our land. We, even the left, uh, the left movements today in Europe, they don't, they have a really very, I would say, incorrect uh, diagnosis, and I'm on the left in my country, and I struggle for that, of our time. We are in a situation, you know, almost, in my view, is pre-fascistic. I, I, in one of my articles, I claim that we live in societies that are political, democratic, but socially fascistic. Mm -hmm. right? So, whenever fascism was in Europe, all the leftist groups united in a front against fascism. Communists, socialists, anarchists, and so on. Today, because we have this idea that we live in democracy, yeah. we go on with all these divisions, as if, and your, your, you know, most... Uh, uh, important enemy is your colleague on the left and not the right very often. And this is damaging. I, I think that any correction on that sort would be very important. The College of Knowledge is an institution that is hostile to that. It's, it's something that you have to do by, by trial and error. I mean, two initiatives uh, to bring in different knowledges in your universe. As I said, schools of law, schools of medicine are doing that throughout the world. Uh, in our society, because Europe was colonized so much by the idea of scientific knowledge, because it's, uh, from where this knowledge really was uh, transplanted to the world, it's very, more, more, uh, it's very diff particularly difficult to bring in this. But I remember when there was a revolution in Portugal, 74, and a democratic revolution, uh, we are celebrating the, the fourth year anniversary of this revolution, we managed to bring peasants from cooperatives into the university to teach our students how you organize peasants and uh, organize cooperatives, for instance. So the context tells you something. And, and uh, I, I think we have to find ways. It wouldn't be me. The idea is that the idea that other knowledges are equally valid for different purposes. But then let, let's discuss the purposes. How do we fight market-oriented universities? Is just with scientific knowledge or bring other knowledge from the outside? If you believe the second, then you are in favor of ecology of knowledge. Then you start working on that. Right? But you have to have a, a diagnosis of that. And uh, our student uh, from California, yeah, it's, 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 it's always been very difficult. And with the best intentions, uh, we have done, reproduce the system. In fact, many people. Um, myself included. I mean, we have to be very careful. In our desire to decolonize, we may recolonize. That's why we have to be very humble, and that's why I never considered myself an avant-garde theorist, but a rear-guard theorist. That is to go with the movements, because they correct us. Whenever we are doing something, because we have a tradition in, in our science, and particularly in the critical theory, that the, the, the critical theory is avant-garde. And, and therefore, whenever things go wrong, you know, the fault is the, is the practice, never the theory. Well, I think it's just the opposite. So we have to really rethink theory from the rear guard. And in fact, I've learned that from so Commandant Marcos, from the Zapatistas. Go with the movements, and probably the ones that go more slowly. Because in the movements there are the leaders and so on, but are, most of the people in the movements are about to give up. They are not motivated, they get tired of uh, organizational work. Go with them. Not with the guys in the front, they don't need you, but you have to facilitate the work together. 
So I think that we should end here, and I thank you again. I think I answered all the questions, and thank you for inviting me.